Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2020 Healthy New York Summit, which, of course, is virtual this year. I'm John Lent, City and State's Editor-in-Chief. I'm glad we have so many people signed on for today's discussions. Uh, look like over 200 and rising right now. Today's topic is more pressing than ever, given the unprecedented public health crisis that we're all grappling with. We'll hear from more than a dozen key policymakers and politicians on all kinds of issues related to the coronavirus pandemic this afternoon. And we're starting off with two of the most influential government figures driving the public health response here in New York. Our first speaker is a commissioner of the State Department of Health. When I introduced him earlier this year at our Health Power 100 event, I noted his key role in pushing to increase vaccination rates, though at the time, the context was the spread of measles. Today, much has changed. Now vaccination is perhaps the nation's single biggest public policy challenge, although it's all about creating a vaccine for COVID-19 and delivering it to millions of people and how quickly we can do so. The commissioner has been in the middle of the state's efforts to combat the coronavirus from the beginning, helping to navigate such politically fraught questions as to when to shut down the state, how to deal with the virus spread in nursing homes, in bars, in schools. And now that New York has dramatically reduced the spread of the virus, how to keep infection rates low, it's a challenge we'll be facing for months. Without further ado, I present State Health Commissioner Howard Zucker. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, this has been an unprecedented time, as we, we all realize. You know, September 1st marked uh, six months since the first coronavirus case was diagnosed in New York State. And during that time, New York went from having the nation's highest COVID-19 infection rate to the lowest. Uh, in the Empire State, the early spring surge was unlike anything seen around the world. Uh, cases doubled overnight on, on both March 5th and March 6th. And during the 72 hour peak between April 11th and April 13th, there were 18,825 patients that were in the hospital, uh, hospitals statewide, 5,225 were in the ICU and 4,494 were intubated. These are unbelievable numbers. Our decision in managing hospitalizations and containing viral spread among nearly 20 million residents prevented at least 100,000 dangerous infections, which were projected by the early epidemiological models that we were looking at at that time. Uh, we didn't just bring the numbers down. We got the infection rate uh, to below 1%, which was consistent for 38 days and, and uh, up to for, for one day barely above 1% and was still now back down uh, below 1%. But as most of the world understands, there is still no victory lap you can take with COVID-19. Uh, for United States residents, winning regional battles does not end a global siege that our nation is tragically uh, unwilling to acknowledge, let alone defend uh, us against. Um, as U.S. states uh, work to hold the line against this deadly virus, there is much we can learn from one another. Uh, and much we can do to help each other as well. So I want to discuss today how New York State navigated this harrowing challenge and how we're keeping New York as safe until our nation is willing and able to get ahead of the virus. Uh, in March and April, New York and the Department of Health uh, strive first and foremost to care for every afflicted patient and to save their lives. Uh, that part of our story is filled with heroic actions from our frontline workers, the healthcare providers, our emergency responders, our essential workers, and, and so many more. But it was a broad scale public cooperation that allowed New Yorkers to avert uh, the direct predictions and to flatten that curve. Every New Yorker helped us safely reopen the state's economy. For any state or nation looking for a how to beat back COVID-19 manual, I really offer our New York tough checklist. So a couple things on that. Based on, uh, base all the decisions on facts, data, and expert analysis. So essentially establish, track, and force metrics uh, for continued local and statewide safety. Be fully transparent with the public. Prioritizing clear communication and easy access to the most current statewide and county data. And we did that. Prioritizing testing and tracing. We need to identify the positive cases through diagnostic testing and aggressively tracing and testing the context of those who test positive and isolating those who are infected. This is done every day, constantly every day, and on a regular basis, uh, you know, I'm, I hear about exactly where, um, where we are and any outbreaks that we have. Forge and maintain partnerships. So these are partnerships with our neighboring states, with nonprofits, uh, with academic institutions. The more partnerships that we have to understand what's going on, the more productive we will be. 
uh, and, and have been. Prepare for the worst case scenario. Now, one has to remember, the model said that we would need 140,000 hospital beds. So you need a plan to get to that number, and that's what we were working on. Um, we can talk a little bit about that uh, more. Acknowledge and clearly report when the information guiding decisions is no longer accurate because the information is changing as we get more scientific information, as we get more data, uh, it does change. And to swiftly develop contingency strategies to move ahead. Leverage the investment of public trust. So the public buy-in through social distancing, mask wearing is the greatest tool that you can have to fight this pandemic. So these seven critical strategies help New York manage the surge in COVID-19 hotspots and to stop the spread everywhere else. Every decision about the New York on pause, which was what uh, we were doing, was applied statewide well beyond the hotspots. So the governor's daily briefings gave, gave New Yorkers a sense of civic connection that has been uh, disrupted by lockdown and unprecedented social um, restraints that had been, you know, had been disrupted. So this gave us a connection to our community. The department's COVID-19 tracker webpage launched in, in back in March continues to provide thorough and detailed daily testing data to the public. You go online, get all the information you want. It's right there. It's very interactive. New York was the first state to mandate masks in mid-April, a decision based on scientific data about aerosol spread that we were not aware of at the beginning of March. So as we had more scientific information about this, uh, we adjusted accordingly. An analysis uh, by the Center for Economic Policy Research found that 40,000 American lives would have been saved in two months if a national mask mandate had gone into effect on, on the 1st of April. When the first COVID-19 case was detected in the United States, only the CDC was permitted to test for the virus. So that uh, performing truly a limited number of diagnostics, because when we sent it down there, they were getting uh, specimens from across the country. So the Department of Health developed its own testing method uh, and the state secured FDA authorization to use the test on February 29th. In fact, the next day was the day that we had our first case, which we tested obviously uh, in New York. Since then, we have to build the world's most extensive, we, we have built, I should say, the world's most extensive COVID-19 testing operation per capita. With more than a thousand testing sites across the state, about uh, 400 in the city, in New York City, we are testing between 70,000 and 100,000 persons per day and we've tested over nine and a half million persons uh, to date. Even with the US COVID-19 positivity rate declining, it was still five times the rate of New York State in mid-September. New York reached out to various nonprofits to address the continued high infection rates in low income and minority communities in New York, uh, New York City. This was another issue uh, that we have um, uh, been addressing and looking at uh, <clears throat> intently. Increasing testing sites at public housing developments and at churches and community-based providers in predominantly minority communities. Uh, we partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies to build a nationally replicable COVID-19 contact tracing program. And the department developed one of the nation's first and most accurate tests to detect COVID-19 antibodies. We collected 15,000 blood samples at grocery stores and community centers all across the state. We had tested essential frontline workers, healthcare workers, first responders. We tested transit workers. We tested members of the NYPD to determine the scale of the infection. Uh, as New York's COVID-19 surge began in March, <clears throat> our 53,000 bed statewide capacity needed to be drastically increased to meet that model that I mentioned before of 140,000 uh, uh, need for potentially 140,000 beds. So to do that, we increased the capacity at our existing hospitals by at least 50%, in some cases 100%. We canceled all elective surgeries statewide. We integrated the state's 23 public and the 200 private hospitals into a single, tightly functioning surgeon flex management system to share patient information and supplies and, and inventories. This was <clears throat> the first time this was done. It was unprecedented. It uh, created a seamless uh, <clears throat> process. We partnered with FEMA, FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers to create the four equipped and staffed temporary hospitals downstate, and the president dispatched the U.S. Navy ship Comfort to New York Harbor. To address a critical shortage of ventilators, we approved a protocol allowing BiPAP machines to, to be converted, <coughs> adapted so they could be used as ventilators, <coughs> and we used the anesthesia machines uh, as well. <coughs> anesthesia machines, as we know, are, are actually ventilators, the anesthesia gases go through these ventilators. So we were using those, uh, those um, anesthesia machines uh, as well. 
After the peak of infections, we developed and we rolled out a data-driven system of regional controls to safely reopen the state. Uh, we created a region, regional consortium with New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, all of our states, our neighboring states, along with obviously us, to ensure a consistent reopening actions along our bordering states. Uh, we made our surge and flex management system not just a stopgap measure, but a bold preemptive system to better control future pandemics. And we are requiring all New York State hospitals to build a 90-day supply of PPE to prepare for a possible second wave of coronavirus hospitalizations and uptick. <clears throat> Every hospital has to have all the PPE they could need for 90 days at the rate of usage we saw when COVID-19 uh, had its outbreak and as it was uh, peaking. Every nursing home also has to have a 60-day supply of PPE at the burn rate that the facility experienced during the COVID-19 outbreak early on. Our New York Forward, uh, NY Forward opening strategy is founded on a metric system integrated within 10 designated regions. It requires a control group in each region to ensure that the infection rate remains below one. Each day, each control group monitors the infection rates on diagnostic testing, the new possible cases based on contact tracing, and the healthcare capacity based on rates of hospitalizations. And the reason we did that also is hospitalizations usually are a, a later finding. You know, it's very important to track, but we realize we need to look, this over, uh, look at this across multiple different uh, factors. We consulted with the experts at the University of Minnesota. We consulted with experts at Imperial College in London uh, to help create the New York's early warning dashboard. And so this dashboard shows the seven reopening metrics that control groups in the state's 10 regions track daily. So this is what we were looking at. We had these metrics. We realized if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, which is an old uh, <clears throat> Lord Kelvin uh, quote, make sure that we can track this. So over the course of two months, all 10 regions reached the metrics for phase four of reopening. And during the summer, the planning for a safely reopening our schools emerged as the most difficult post-lockdown challenge for every state in the nation, not just New York, but every state. So New York State's schools were given permission to reopen for in-person learning based on the infection rate of the region in which the school district is located and other public health criteria. Each school district was required to develop and submit a reopening plan that addresses department guidance and follows strict procedures to protect against viral transmission. Beginning on the 8th of September, each school district was required to provide the department with daily data on the number of people who would have tested positive for COVID-19 in each school. And then this information is publicly available on a department-developed uh, online dashboard that went live earlier this week. So we have all this information. We provide this information, as I said earlier, transparency, get the information out there. For colleges, a state threshold requires that any institution with 100 reported COVID-19 cases uh, on campus or more on campus must go to remote learning for two weeks at which time the state will reassess the situation. And on the 6th of September, New York and SUNY launched a COVID-19 case tracker dashboard to provide real-time data on COVID-19 cases, on testing, on quarantine, isolation space, available across the 64 colleges and university campuses of the SUNY system. So we understand how easily our low infection status could change with new outbreaks imported from other states or from letting down our guard. And this is why we've been very, very careful. But New York has taken the precautions. We implemented quarantines for persons arriving from a state with a positive test rate higher than 10 per 100,000 residents <clears throat> over a seven day rolling average, or a state with 10% up or higher positivity rate also over a seven day rolling average. <clears throat> so these individuals would need to be quarantined for 14 days. And we created a multi-agency task force led by the state police, led by and document violations at establishments, another area where we're concerned the potential for, uh, for disease spread. And given that COVID-19 is linked to airborne transmission, we are studying filters and air conditioning systems to make uh, the industry recommendations on filtration technology to prevent the spread of COVID-19 through uh, AC systems. So as I mentioned earlier, this is about data, it's about information. As more information data comes in, we're able to adjust, uh, put the right regulations in place, uh, and do whatever is necessary to protect the public. Additionally, the Department of Health is working with the local health departments on an all-out push to encourage all eligible New Yorkers to get their influenza vaccination this fall. 
if a second wave of coronavirus hits <clears throat> when flu season is underway, <clears throat> it could truly catastrophically strain our hospitals. Now, we don't know how bad the flu season is going to be, but again, you plan for the worst and hope for the best. Way back on January 23rd, <clears throat> nearly eight months ago now, <clears throat> I addressed a city and state gathering, uh, as was mentioned, and I was fairly optimistic about what lay ahead, lie ahead in uh, 20, I said a new era in healthcare and medicine. I actually remember that presentation because it was a couple weeks into when this uh, coronavirus was first announced in the news. And you know, I remember in one of our conversations, we were talking a little bit about what was happening in China. The great irony is that between then and now is that this is actually is a new era of healthcare and medicine. <clears throat> People in all parts of the world have accepted a new status quo of public health safety. What's painful to consider now, however, is as both New Yorkers and Americans, is what we did not know at the outset of this crisis, back then and at that time in January, that SARS-CoV-2 was coming to New York directly from Europe in February, that 40% of transmission is through asymptomatic spread, that wearing a mask effectively controls transmission, that the minority population are at a heightened risk, that COVID-19 can attack any organ beyond the respiratory system, and that the disease poses risks but significant threats to even the pediatric population. Other factors affecting our initial COVID response were that the CDC had a two-month delay in the national availability of an effective diagnostic test. And this was of concern because as we realize now, the importance of diagnostic testing and the nation's lack of a coordinated medical supply chain that contribute to the critical shortages and the price gouging uh, in New York and other states for that matter, all across the country. Despite these unprecedented challenges, I remain optimistic about the future of public health in New York State. I remain optimistic because I believe uh, in the people of New York uh, and the ability uh, to work together to achieve uh, the goals we set forth. By themselves, New Yorkers may not be able to move mountains, but we certainly work together to get down from a big one. We accepted the hard truths early on. We've girded ourselves for the long haul doing what's right out of love and respect for each other. As the governor always says, e pluribus unum, which was added to the state's seal, uh, has meant something significant for everyone during this difficult time. We know that each of us must keep on modifying our behaviors to stop COVID-19 infections, keep our neighbors across the state safe. And that's our job as New Yorkers. We are collectively on it. I thank all the New Yorkers for everything you're doing to achieve this goal. And I thank city and state for inviting me today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, before we go on to our next speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors today. Uh, we couldn't put on these kinds of events without their generous support. We have Google, Pharma, New York Foundling, HealthX, the Mental Health Association of Westchester, Primary Care Development Corporation, Montefiore Medical and Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Brown and Wydron. I'll now hand things over to Todd Rago, President and CEO of HealthX, who will introduce our next speaker. Uh, Todd, over to you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Todd Rago, President and CEO of HealthX. And today is my honor to introduce Dr. Dave A. Chach. Chach I can never get your last name right here. I apologize. Dr. Dave A. Uh, Chach. Uh, the newly appointed health commissioner for the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, many of us know the doctor in his previous role as chief population health officer at NYC H&H &H, uh, Hospital, um, where he built and grew an award-winning team dedicated to health information improvement, um, which span innovative healthcare models, analytics, primary care transformation, and community-based care management and chronic disease prevention. As a primary care physician at Bellevue Hospital, uh, the doctor has taken care of patients there since 2014. Throughout his career, he has served the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including positions at the New York City and State Departments of Health and the Louisiana Department of Health before and after Hurricane Katrina. Um, the doctor has served on uh, FEMA's delegation to New York City after Superstorm Sandy in 2012. He also served as a White House Fellow and was a Principal Health Advisor to the Secretary of, the, of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the doctor has written widely in public health and medicine, including publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
Health Affairs, Science and Scientific America, as well as several others. Um, in 2016, President Obama appointed him to an advisory group on prevention, health promotion, and public health. Currently, Dr. Chotsky um, is in the face of our New York City, is the face of, our, of the city's COVID-19 awareness and prevention efforts. Seen regularly on television public service announcements, his noticeable, his notable work in public health will assuredly deepen and expand the reach of the New York City Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, especially during these demanding times. Closer to home, HealthX looks forward to our continued partnership with the department and its bureaus um, in supporting meaningful initiatives that benefit New Yorkers. HealthX has played a critical role in supporting public health during this pandemic. We continue to assist both private and government entities throughout through collaborations and new services, including our COVID-19 alerts, teaming with Northwell Health to support the transfer of patients across New York City to the Javits Center Field Hospital, uh, providing city officials with access to our patient encounter data to help find missing loved ones uh, through the 311 and the UBIS system, enhancing the state's capacity to track specific patient cohorts and lending support to the VA hospitals in, in transferring patients from non-VA facilities in New York City. And recently our work is in support of uh, health and hospitals uh, contact tracing efforts, which we're excited to be a part of. Now more than ever, providers will rely on aggregated and shared data to draw disparate healthcare entities closer together and help shape population health management strategies. While this next phase in public health and clinical medicine will likely be fraught with unique and trying challenges under the commis commis commissioner's leadership, I am hopeful it'll also be a time of heightened innovation and breakthroughs. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, welcome, Commissioner. Thank you as well for, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we heard from the State Health Commissioner a lot of the factors that have gone into bringing that rate down, the transmission rate, infection rate in New York, uh, dramatically. Um, wanted to ask you, will that rate go up? Is it unavoidable? You know, if kids are going back to school, uh, college campuses are opening, uh, there may be some indoor dining in the near future. Um, again, will that number uh, inevitably go up? Uh, well, thank you, John. And first of all, let me just say thank you so much for uh, having me um, be a part of this important forum. Uh, there's no more important topic uh, these days, so, uh, so I appreciate the chance to participate. Um, my starting point on this is that uh, we know what works, um, you know, from our experience over the last several months uh, here in New York City. Um, and as with many public health efforts, uh, it's not rocket science, you know, it's, um, it's things that are tried and true with respect to interrupting transmission, uh, social distancing, uh, making sure that people are washing their hands, uh, making sure that when people are feeling ill, uh, they stay home, uh, and then really importantly, wearing face coverings as well, as Commissioner Zucker mentioned. So um, we, should, uh, we should make sure that we have learn those lessons, but also that we don't become complacent about them uh, as we head into uh, the fall and the cooler months. Um, and there are a few ways, you know, that I'm thinking about this. Uh, let me just highlight kind of two categories here. Um, the first is we have to take all of those individual actions that I mentioned, continue to make sure that we're communicating about them but also supplement them with, um, with other things that we can do at the community and the city level as well. Um, I think about this as uh, really focusing on being data-driven uh, and making sure that our uh, COVID-19 efforts are hyper-local as well. Um, data-driven means we have to pull from every single information stream we can get our hands on with respect to understanding uh, the evolution of the virus and its spread uh, in New York City. Uh, we have a number of ways of doing that at the health department ourselves, 
uh, but we also partner with a number of, of other people to make sure that we have uh, the firmest grasp possible about what's happening with respect to COVID-19. That in turn leads to our hyperlocal efforts, which, um, which is to take advantage of the fact that because as a city, we are at a better level of virus transmission, um, we have a chance to prevent further spread and look at, you know, at the community level, at the neighborhood level or the zip code level, uh, places that may be emerging, you know, with respect to uh, further sp spread of the coronavirus. Um, we did this in Tremont in the Bronx, as well as Sunset Park and Borough Park in Brooklyn, really bringing to bear all of the resources that we can, whether it's knocking on doors, making robocalls, working with community leaders, faith leaders, um, you know, fellow clinicians and, uh, and clinical leaders, uh, but also bringing our testing resources, including mobile testing resources to bear in those areas. Uh, so those are the ways that we're thinking about how to, um, you know, how to ensure that we, uh, that we prevent any resurgence. Um, and let me take a pause there. Yeah, sure. And let me jump in with um, a more specific point. Just today, the mayor announced a more phased in approach to in-person classes. I think starting with pre-K and special needs, uh, some, some in-person education there, uh, others coming to school in October. Um, that seems to be, obviously there are reasons to have school and have education in person, but that seems to be a major new increased risk. Um, I guess what role did you play in that decision, if any, and, and, and what's the latest medical perspective there? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I'm part of the, the team that is working on uh, all of the major policy de decisions that bear on health and the coronavirus. Um, I'll say our overarching philosophy around reopening has been to do it in a methodical way. Um, you know, we know that, uh, that reopening uh, of any type uh, comes with some risk associated with it. Uh, you know, as a doctor, I'm used to dealing with, with risk, but also making sure that we take into account risks and put them aside benefits uh, and really making decisions, you know, based on weighing the relative risks and benefits. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the philosophy that we have about uh, methodical reopening. And what you heard from the mayor this morning uh, is really reflective of that philosophy that we have to make sure that we um, we do things in a way that uh, manages risk appropriately. But I want to spend a minute just talking about the benefit side of the equation as well, because it gets to how we should be thinking about prioritizing in our reopening decisions. Um, and what you know, the mayor has been very clear about, uh, and which I strongly agree with, is that we should think about those areas that have the greatest uh, benefit for the people of New York. Um, I think about it, you know, as the health commissioner from the health perspective, but we also have to think about uh, economic benefit as well, which ties into people's health, frankly. Uh, and school reopening is really, um, you know, a, a particularly uh, important example where we know there are so many health benefits to being able to reopen schools for in-person instruction. Uh, and so it's a worthy mission, you know, for us to try to take on and to try to um, uh, to make sure that we're doing it as safely as possible. But the health benefits that I keep in mind are, you know, the direct benefits of kids being able to learn, uh, the social and emotional development that comes along with it, but also all of the health services that are provided through schools, whether it's making sure that people have uh, meals, you know, so that they're eating uh, nutritiously to the mental health services that are provided through schools, um, you know, through ways of managing asthma in children. Uh, there's this whole uh, panoply of things that happen through our public school system that bear on the health and particularly the health of our children. Sure, and, and one thing I did wanna to pivot to as well, testing, obviously that's been cited as a key ingredient to moving forward safely as a society. Uh, I just read the city's opening a lab in Manhattan to get results faster. The mayor's touted testing that's now getting results in 48 or even 24 hours. Uh, how important is that? And, and will there be enough testing capacity this fall, including in things like in-person education, um, college campuses, indoor dining, uh, it can, I guess gotten some improvements there, but, but 
if you could outline that and, and will it be enough? Sure, yes, testing is, is also a really important part of our strategy. It's important at the individual level for, for reasons that, um, you know, that are uh, apparent. Uh, people want to know whether they have COVID-19 or not. I think about my own patients, you know, many of whom uh, I've gotten tested for uh, COVID-19. And that's very important at the personal level, you know, for yourself, um, but also to be able to make sure that you're protecting your, your family, your loved ones, you know, other people that you're interacting with. Uh, so it's very important at the individual level. But as the health commissioner, I also think about the importance of testing at the population level. And from that perspective, it's important because it's another way um, that we can help interrupt the spread of coronavirus. Because when more and more people know about, uh, about their COVID-19 status, particularly people who test positive, they can take the steps to break the chains of transmission, you know, to make sure that they're appropriately isolating while they're infectious. Um, and thereby uh, make sure that, you know, one person who's getting infected doesn't turn into two or three more people who are getting infected. Uh, so that's why it's important at the population level as well. To get more specifically to your questions, uh, yes, you know, the city has, um, has really invested a lot in uh, trying to improve capacity and availability of testing but importantly, doing it in a way that also prioritizes rapid turnaround of testing. This is something that has been, you know, candidly uh, a challenge at the national level in particular, making sure that there's adequate capacity, making sure that it uh, occurs in a turnaround time uh, that actually maximizes the benefit of getting tested. Um, and so the city has been very aggressive uh, and I think is a leader nationally with respect to uh, investing in those resources. That's what the lab that was announced yesterday uh, reflects. Also say the health department, you'll be hearing more about this, but our, uh, our health department also has a, a number of sites known as our COVID Express uh, sites, which uh, are being located at, um, at our public health clinics, for example, the clinics that normally take care of people who have sexually transmitted infections or tuberculosis, we're bringing testing resources on site uh, at those clinics, which are often in uh, some of the most marginalized you know, neighborhoods and communities in New York City, um, to be able to provide rapid testing at those locations as well. So we have nine of those that are currently active. Now, Commissioner, you're a medical professional and a, and a policy expert, but also a political appointee. Um, to whatever degree you have to factor political realities into your decision making. Um, can you weigh in on the degree to which the pandemic has become political? We've seen pressure to get a vaccine before the November election, efforts to sanitize official federal health reports, shifting blame among elected officials. Um, has it become too political and does it make your job harder? Well, you know, I would say uh, public health and politics have always been intertwined and that's because uh, so many of the important things that we do to try to preserve and protect uh, the public's health have to do with um, with decisions about values and what what values are most important, you know, in our society. Um, my starting point with this is that, uh, you know, the values that I personally hold most dear and that uh, the health department, you know, has historically uh, are very clear to me. It, it starts with uh, science and the pursuit of truth, um, but importantly, equity is another central value for all of our work. Uh, and then third, and really speaking as a doctor, it's important to me that compassion uh, is also at the center of everything that we do. Um, and I think particularly important given how much uh, suffering we've witnessed in New York City over the last few months, keeping that in mind as we make, you know, some of the most challenging decisions that, um, you know, that people are undertaking with respect to, uh, to this pandemic. But our North Stars should be, you know, the values that are most important and uh, science, equity, and compassion uh, are, are the ones that, uh, that our health department will lead with. I want to say one other thing about, you know, this important question about the intersection of politics and public health. And actually, I'll use a, I'll use a prop because it's our um, you know, it's our mask, it's our face coverings that are among the most visible and tangible reminders of what happens when, 
you know, I wouldn't call it politics, I would actually call it polarization, uh, when that changes, uh, you know, the, the public dialogue in a way that can be extremely harmful to people. And that's when I get the most concerned is when something that we know works, that we know is an effective way of preventing suffering and saving lives, when that becomes part of a polarized conversation so that people are not wearing masks, then that is uh, problematic, you know, and that is something that we have to find ways to um, reset our public dialogue uh, so that even when there are disagreements about, um, you know, about political stances, we can do the things that everyone should agree with, which is preventing suffering and saving lives. Sure. Following, uh, following up directly on that point, uh, just this week, the president uh, continued to make headlines for challenging top federal health care officials. The CDC director said a vaccine would not be widely available until the middle of next year, and that masks, as you were talking about, were perhaps more important even than a vaccine. Uh, the president said, quote, I think he made a mistake when he said that. It's just incorrect information, uh, and that a vaccine would go to the general public immediately, under no circumstances will it be as late as the doctor said. Uh, reaction to that episode specifically? Uh, well, um, we should get away from the false dichotomies. You know, we, we need masks and we need a vaccine. And that should be inarguable with respect to, you know, the direction that we need to go into as a country and as a city. I think what, um, what Dr. Redfield uh, you know, was alluding to was the fact that we don't have a vaccine today, but we do have masks today. Um, we have all of those other efforts that I talked about that we know have been effective to help control COVID-19. So let's focus on those things today, even as we plan and prepare for a reality, which you know, uh, just as much as the next person, I hope it will be uh, reality in our near future where we have a COVID-19 vaccine as well. Um, so, you know, there's no reason to make this an either or phenomenon when, uh, when both are helpful. Sure. And in terms of vaccines, what do you think the likelihood is, or are you worried about, you know, maybe a risky vaccine gets rushed out or we get a good vaccine, but, but people are afraid to take it? Um, well, again, I'll just speak about my experience as a as a doctor as an entry point here. And um, you know, you, you we have to uh, have empathy about you know how people are uh, are thinking about um, vaccines. We have to recognize that in certain uh, communities, particularly in certain racial and ethnic groups, there is uh, a deep and troubling history of um, you know of medical interventions being used against the will of people. Uh, and so, you know, those are things that um, factor into uh, how we should talk about a COVID-19 vaccine, how we should convey and communicate, um, you know, the, the necessity of vaccination when a safe and effective vaccine uh, is available um, because it will protect uh, not just individuals, but communities. Um, so we have to do these things in a way that uh, that promote trust, recognizing that um, that historically, you know, we may be uh, operating at a deficit, particularly again within certain communities. So I think what's most important uh, to highlight is the idea that, um, you know, first we have to make sure that the sanctity of uh, the approval processes for uh, for vaccines is beyond reproach. Um, you know, both with respect to safety as well as uh, efficacy of a COVID-19 vaccine. So anything that undermines that, uh, I find particularly troubling. Um, and I'll say, you know, for, for New York City, we will be uh, looking at the data ourselves. We'll be, uh, you know, certainly in constant contact with our counterparts at the CDC uh, and others around the world. Um, but we have a responsibility to protect New Yorkers, uh, and so we'll be uh, we'll be you know doing our our evaluations of how things are uh, are being approved um, before we make any decisions about uh, about spreading the word for New Yorkers to get vaccinated. 
Sure, certainly. Uh, we talked about testing. I did want to ask a question too about contact tracing efforts, and, and we will hear about that more uh, in the first panel when your colleagues will be um, sharing about that. But you're a veteran of uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, which was assigned to run the contact tracing efforts despite the health department's history of doing so. Uh, your predecessor, Dr. Oksiris Babo, was critical of the administration when she resigned. She said, quote, I leave my post with deep disappointment that during the most critical public health crisis in our lifetime, the health department's incomparable disease control expertise was not used to the degree that it should have been. Um, and, and she went on and made some other points. Um, do you agree or disagree with that assessment? And, and to what degree are you uh, involved with uh, contact tracing at this point? I'm sure. Well, look, what I know is that the virus respects no boundaries. It doesn't respect geographic boundaries. Um, you know, it doesn't uh, respect um, individual boundaries. Uh, and it certainly doesn't respect organizational boundaries. Uh, and so if we want to have the most robust response to the coronavirus, uh, we have to be just as aggressive uh, as the virus is itself. Uh, and so what does that mean? That means that, uh, you know, we have to undertake a whole of government approach as the city has done, frankly, uh, across multiple different uh, departments, you know, with respect to how we're fighting COVID-19. For testing and contact tracing, um, you know, that's a partnership. Uh, the health department plays a, a really uh, deep and fundamental, fundamental role with both. Uh, we talked about testing already. For contact tracing, we have um, you know, some of the most experienced disease detectives in the entire world uh, working within the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I can assure you that, uh, that we're bringing every single resource that we have to bear uh, to support uh, contact tracing in New York City. We're working with the Test and Trace Corps, uh, and I know that you have Dr. Long on, on one of the upcoming panels. Um, they've, done, uh, they've done a remarkable job in uh, standing up uh, the efforts that they have in scaling up uh, rapidly over the last few weeks and months. Uh, and we work in a hand in glove partnership, uh, you know, across health and hospitals and uh, the Department of Health. Well, you know, just maybe two other things that I can say on this. One is um, we in healthcare and public health, uh, I feel strongly should look at the pandemic as an opportunity to tear down any remaining walls that exist, you know, between, uh, between healthcare delivery and public health. We have seen how a public health response is necessary to prevent people from coming into our emergency departments and our hospitals and our intensive care units on the healthcare delivery side. So again, you know, the disease does not respect those boundaries and neither should we. Uh, and one of the things that I hope um, that I'm able to do as, as commissioner, as someone who does have a healthcare background is to, to help build, you know, stronger bridges between public health and healthcare. And then the last thing that I'll just say on this point is that it it's, goes far beyond health and hospitals and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene as well. Um, you know, I was uh, walking through our situation room uh, yesterday that we've set up to, um, to assist with school reopening, particularly around communication of, um, of uh, COVID-19 testing results and what actions school leaders should take when cases are discovered in schools. And that's, a, again, a remarkable whole of government approach. Um, the DOE, uh, our health department, the Test and Trace Corps, the Department of Buildings, um, many others who are involved with that. Uh, and so I'm really uh, proud and I wanna see even more collaboration going forward, um, given the scale of what we're up against. Sure, that, that just brought to mind an, another question. I think you saw a lot of news stories about different hospital systems, public systems, private systems, not communicating with each other enough. You know, the, maybe a certain hospital had excess capacity, another didn't, but people didn't get transferred because you have this fragmented uh, system in New York State. Uh, I know we have a couple state lawmakers who'll be speaking shortly that are pushing for single payer or, or Medicare for all. Um, is there room for something like that where the government um, takes on more of a role for healthcare and, and less of a role for, 
for private actors? And, and what's your view on what, if anything, should change along those lines? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question. And, you know, I do think that there were lessons learned. Uh, you know, I was a part of our um, COVID-19 response in March and April uh, on the hospital side. Um, you know, and it was, um, it, it was a very harrowing and challenging time with respect to preparing for the patient surge that we saw. Uh, and so I think, you know, even greater coordination, although there was a lot that was stood up, you know, in, the, in those days leading up to the peak in early April. Um, but I also think that there are, now that we are in a better place than we were in March and April, you know, there's been a chance to catalog the lessons learned um, to understand, you know, how we might build better systems for, uh, for you know, whenever the next, uh, the next surge may be, whether it's coronavirus or, you know, a different, uh, a different pandemic, uh, and ensure that, you know, there is um, coordination across systems. Um, I think, you know, there is a role for, for government to play, but, um, but I also think that, uh, you know, I would urge and challenge uh, the, the healthcare systems themselves to, um, you know, to, to help with this and to, uh, to organize and participate in the organizing of, uh, of even, you know, deeper uh, collaboration. And I think that the importance of it is that um, it's, not, it's not just something that is in the interest of the city as a whole and the people that we serve. Um, it's also in the interest of individual systems, you know, to be able to be a part of a network uh, that is more nimble um, and that can share information in real time. Uh, and so, you know, I, I know our team is thinking actively about how to implement some of those lessons learned. And uh, I would welcome partnership with, uh, with any of the healthcare systems in New York City to that end. Uh, we're, we're close to out of time. Uh, I could go on for another half hour if we had it, but I did want to take one audience question. Uh, I can't I'd say I've fact check these numbers, but we have an audience member saying, we see COVID-19 transmission rates in certain neighborhoods in New York are now two to 3%. As I walk around Forest Hills, I see around 50% compliance rate of wearing masks. How do you propose we can address this as both a community and as a city? Well, thanks for that great question. And it's, um, it, it really does point up uh, our challenge going forward. Um, it is, you know, part of human nature, I think, to, uh, to become complacent, uh, you know, to, uh, to get more relaxed. And we have to, it's all of our jobs, you know, to, um, to resist that. Uh, um, John, I think you're a, you're a Queens resident as well. Is that right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the, the audience member um, mentioned Forest Hills. Uh, I also live in Queens. Um, and I think it's a telling place to, you know, to talk about because so many communities um, saw so much tragedy and suffering uh, during March and April and May. Um, and even in those places, um, we are seeing some, uh, you know, some behavior that, uh, that I think will um, you know, will put us at greater risk. Uh, and we're doing everything that we can, you know, with respect to public communication, with respect to those hyper-local efforts uh, that I talked about. And I should say in Queens, you know, we're moving to, um, to Ozone Park uh, and a handful of other uh, neighborhoods in, in Queens as well. So those are things that uh, certainly we have responsibility for. Um, but again, the scale of this uh, goes far beyond any individual department uh, and even beyond government in many ways. So I would urge you know, anyone who is tuning in right now, we all have a responsibility to, um, you know, to try to protect one another. Uh, if I can squeeze in one, uh, one sort of um, promotion for another way that we can protect one another, you know, I've already given you my, my um, prop about the mask it's such a, again, a visible reminder of how, um, how we're all in the same boat and I can wear a mask to help uh, protect you. Um, in the same way, we're heading into influenza season uh, and a flu vaccine is really important to be able to do that as well. So, um, you know, my goal as commissioner is to try to vaccinate more New Yorkers against influenza than have ever been vaccinated uh, against the flu. 
Um, but that is something that I would like to enlist everyone's help on uh, so, uh, so we can protect one another. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Unfortunately, we, we are out of time, but very much appreciate it. Uh, in 10 minutes, the top of the hour, we'll go to our first panel. But first, we have a special presentation by Michael McConnell, clinical lead at mobile health and devices with Google Health. Uh, we'll bring him up and bring up his presentation momentarily. As we're waiting for Mike, I'll just thank you again, uh, put a thank you out to our sponsors. Our sponsors today are Google, Pharma. And I'm checking, can you all hear me? Oh yes, great. I can hear you, Mike. Uh, is this better? Yeah, I can hear you now, I can't see you. Okay. There How's that? Great. And I'll try to share my screen again. How is that working? Perfect. Great. Well, hopefully uh, we've got uh, this next sort of seven minutes and hopefully the technology will keep working. Um, so right, I'm Mike McConnell. I'm a physician, part of Google Health, and uh, it's really an honor to be able to present today on behalf of really both Apple and Google around uh, our exposure notification uh, program and project that's designed to support public health in the fight for COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> again, happy to support New York here. And on the personal side, I grew up in Brooklyn, my mom was head of nursing at Brooklyn Hospital, which I know was very uh, key in the front line in New York's battle against COVID-19. So it's a real uh, honor to, to talk with you all today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what exposure notifications, what the system is, sort of can walk you through uh, how it's envisioned to work or how it has been working. Uh, and then we can talk about Sort of the current status of the program and some of the early uh, results uh, across the world. So exposure notifications, this is the, the term we're using to describe um, a system that runs on your phone that can provide alerts uh, to let you know that you've been exposed to someone diagnosed with COVID-19. So there are three really important components to this. I think the first and foremost is this is really designed as an additional tool to help public health. So it's really designed not to replace, but to enhance what public health can already do in terms of uh, adding to contact tracing, testing, mask wearing, uh, as uh, Commissioner Zucker said at the outset. Uh, another key element is that it's designed to be very privacy preserving. So it only uses non-identifiable Bluetooth signals. So, you know, when you uh, phones then connect to other devices, uh, use Bluetooth. So uh, we've developed a way that this uses non-identifiable signals. They do relate to how close you are to someone else's phone. Um, but again, it's designed to protect people's privacy and does not use GPS tracking. Uh, and then, Key is also that it's led by public health. So uh, public health decides when to make this system available to its residents, how they define based on the latest guidance, what is too close for too long, uh, what are all the steps uh, when you get a notification to do next, uh, and then you know communicating with residents uh, about how to get engaged with it. 
importantly, Apple and Google uh, developed this together uh, in collaboration with many discussions with public health authorities around the US, around the world, and doing this together to make sure it uses very secure technology and it's compatible across both types of operating systems so that these different phones can talk to each other effectively. Uh, and so that it runs well without impacting battery life so that it can really run in the background and, and be easy to use. So how does this work? Um, so the idea is that if Alice and Bob uh, happen to be talking to each other, uh, particularly if they don't know each other, uh, and so they wouldn't be able to remember later who, who they had been talking to necessarily, uh, that if they're sitting a bit close for a little too long, the, during that uh, interaction, their phones are exchanging these Bluetooth beacons that are not identifiable. Again, this is uh, only if they've chosen to participate in the system. Uh, a few days later, on the right side of the screen, uh, if Bob happens to test positive for uh, COVID-19, he can opt to um, share that information to help others he's been in contact with. Uh, and so with his consent, it can upload the last two weeks of these Bluetooth keys um, to uh, a server. Again, it doesn't have any information uh, about Bob. It's all non-identifiable. Um, but that way, uh, Alice, um, her phone can periodically download these Bluetooth keys from people like Bob who tested positive. And then actually on her phone, it looks to see if uh, any of these positive diagnosed uh, Bluetooth keys match up with uh, someone that she was uh, too close to for too long. Um, so in this case, it finds a match with Bob um, and then the phone can give her uh, an exposure notification Importantly, the public health authority decides, you know, what the notification would say, what next steps to do um, or in terms of quarantine, symptom monitoring, get tested, and call public health. So uh, this exposure notification system has been launched by public health around the world, including in multiple U.S. states. Um, as of this week, we have 25 states, territories, the District of Columbia are pursuing EN solutions uh, covering over half the U.S. population. Uh, the states that have launched so far include Virginia, North Dakota, Wyoming, Alabama, Arizona, Nevada, Guam, and Delaware. Uh, you see an example on the right of uh, Virginia's exposure notification uh, application. Um, that you know, is welcoming the user to, to enable. Uh, and then around the world, uh, 25 countries and regions have launched apps, uh, and we'll highlight a few of those as well. Um, just a few more slides, but I think importantly, uh, we did a study with Oxford um, using a lot of the simulation work that they've pioneered and mobility data specifically from Washington State to show that using exposure notification on top of manual contact tracing really can enhance the ability to reduce infections and reduce deaths. So even with just 15% of adoption of exposure notification can reduce infections by 15% and deaths by 11%. And certainly as the table shows, the more adoption, the even greater impact that one can have. Um, the panels at the top show with just exposure notification by itself um, that you can see that the, the rise in new infections can be dampened down and certainly the more adoption uh, you get greater effect. And then the bottom graphic shows how um, exposure notification plus the contact tracing really work synergistically to, to bring uh, infections down. And just to close, we're still really in the early learning phases, um, given this has been launched just for a couple of months. 
but we are seeing examples of exposure notifications working. Uh, on the left side, some of the state countries that have launched uh, in June and July, 